You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. We're joined in the studio with the um, group and we've been talking all about a roof over their heads project. Uh, we're now doing some uh, readings and um, we're going to be um, hearing uh, Bob's reading next. Thank you, Daniel. Um, this is uh, History 29 Manor, The Dwelt. A monologue, any monologue, nay this monologue. I proceed, but what's to say or rather write? A house, any house, nay this house. A house story, any house story, nay this house story. Our house story, 29 Manor. Our house story begins with us, the house occupants. This house story casts a veil across and over its few pre-war or pro-war years build. Well, it's a small house, two up, two down, long hall, no garage, no shed, no porch, mid-terrace, left and middle down the street. Nothing grand, as is its occupants. Us, we are ordinary. Not just any ordinary, but a lowly proud ordinary. This family, an upright common English British family who didn't and doesn't own or build, but occupied this house by payment of a weekly rent charge. This family dwelt. Watching. Grandfather had survived the Great War, body intact. No loss of right limb. He paired to his knee would march medals aglow, stiff in his gait as far as his false limb would allow, far across town. There in the entrance to the house he would sit or stand, his stocky stature filling the small open frame doorway, he casting shadows into the long hallway, smiling genially during and after the midday or even mayday parade. He sat watching and officiated as mother orchestrated the evening meal or early evening supper. Mother hustled and bustled, one hand holding her skirts and towel as she made tea. We sit in floor size, we could see the vapours or steam arising from the metal kettle and currently where nearby. Either where teapot, china cups, china saucers, glazed milk jug, china sugar bowls, they were placed above our small frames on the mid kitchen table. It could do us no harm. Then just as mother took off her rose printed, bud printed apron, we a knock was heard at the now closed front door. The coronation. In the hallway, Mother skirted the hall carpet and curtsied as she opened the door. Evening, Mrs Ems, rasped the caller. Weekly rent and rates due, he continued. Mother acknowledged with a nod. As I noted, the tall man's overcoated stature. The rent and rate collector stood poised. He opened his ledger and with pen in his hand, Gave a full-throated er. Uh. Yes, said Mother, interrupting. I'll pay the rates, but I'm withholding my rent until the landlord does the repairs. The house repairs are long overdue. Mother produced her purse after fumbling in her skirt's pocket. Here, she said, and handed over sufficient payment in notes and coins to pay her rates. Please call again next week, won't you? See you then. Bye, said Mother. And on closing the door, she skirted back in with us just in time to catch the opening repeat of the 1953 coronation showing on the 12-inch black-and-white box TV set sat high on the front room shelf. Chair city and armchair-wise, we sat comfy, watching bogged-eyed. Back home. Father held baby Paul aloft as he strolled the garden pathway. We were in conversation. Yes, said he. He switched the rates payments to rent payments and said the rates were withheld. Well, he shrugged and turned to me. I standing at his feet. Jump in the motor and I'll take you to Queenborough Corner to say goodbye to Mum. They have taken her into custody for not paying her the rates. Paul let out a wail. Wah, wah, babes in arms. They fired and motioned us up the garden path to the front gate to the waiting motor. As we approached Queenborough Corner, we could see the police car stopped a little way ahead of us and there adjacent stood Mother idled by the fonts of petrol pumps lying in the garage gravel driveway. As one police lady and a police and two policemen hovered nearby, Mother waved when suddenly was bustled by the police into the waiting black police car. The car whisked off with her waving out the back window. We with father did a U-turn and headed back home. Playtime. The pot contents boiled and bubbled, spat, put. Grandad lifted the saucepan to pour. Mike was giving the porridge a little help with his stir. Breakfast was served as Baby Paul dipped his ladle and put it to his lips to taste, then swiftly putting the used ladle back into and under the tap flowing nearby earthenware sink. 
I held my dish up and out and was rewarded by a double helping, as Grandad said in his best Georgie accent, don't put salt on, it's the Scots way to put salt on. I never could have cared for it much. It will only upset your tummy. Eat, enjoy and digest, then be off to school. Your satchel jacket are hung over the chair back. Finished and off to school, he said. I left the table, my satchel and jacket hung loose on my shoulders as I opened the door to step into the cold, fresh, crisp morning airs. I made my way along the tree-lined main street to take the narrow rail bridge route over and down into the elementary school playground. With a premise, my brothers and sisters would soon follow with any news. Winter's Eve. My sister Christina and June hurried along the narrow paved path. As we reached our school gateway, they stood firmly in conversation through the black-painted, paling bar railings, engrossed with Brother Steve. I approached my expression and gait, questioning they for any important news. Brother Stephen said, Mum's back home. They let her go. The rent and rate collector broke down and confessed. He'd taken the money and swapped details because the landlord threatened to sack him. Steve continued, The magistrate said Mum should have got a receipt. What a cheek. What do honest, upright people need receipts for? Our word is evident. Just then, a ring, clang, ring, bring was heard. The school headmistress had interrupted by ringing the school bell. Eagerly, we collected our coats from the school cloakroom and set off on a not-so-far-away route home. The darkness slowly falling on this November 5th, Winter's Eve. Fairy Cakes as we reached home, Steve, Tina, June and I could see our front door stood open, so we stepped inside. Standing on the front mat, we were greeted by Mum's hugs and smiles, and there, under the warm glow of the gas mantle flame, lay in a cot my newborn sister Michelle and brother Mike standing by, and further sat on the kitchen table were fairy cakes, cupcakes, sausages, sausage rolls, cheese and tomato sandwich, cucumber sandwich and soup and rolls, and father sat in his favourite wicker chair, with baby Paul sat at his knee, navy hat in his lap, they smiled in our tea time welcome. This then is one of the fond memories I cherish of my childhood in this house, then held in the warm shadow of Grandad, sitting benignly at table, cutting meat or slicing cake for an end of day evening meal we in this house celebrated under our, a roof over our heads. Thank you. We're now joined with um, Lisa Marie. Thank you. Um, because my house is a new build, um, I couldn't really do any research about it or anybody who lived in it. So um, I went to Sheerness Library and had a look through the old newspapers um, and spotted that in 1892 there was a masked ball held at the Victoria Club uh, in Sheerness. So I took that as my starting point. Um, and found that a woman named Emma Williams had lived in Sheerness at the time and so I took her as my main character. Um, in this extract, she's just pulling up to the uh, Victoria Club um, ready to enter the masked ball. Emma carefully put her head out of the small gap in the door of the handsome cab. Are we there? Knowing full well that they were not, knowing that they were a walk away from the Victoria Club yet, Emma's heart jumped a little. What arduous issue was rearing up now? Why was nothing ever simple any more? She wondered if it ever had been. Not exactly, miss. The driver, John MacDonald, shuffled from one foot to the other, turning his cap in his hands. It's just... There's a bit of a commotion up ahead and the horse won't like waiting. I know it's a liberty, miss, but if the horse gets afeard and bolts, I could lose my carriage and there's ever such a long line of cabs ahead of us. A commotion? Emma was curious, so much so that she forgot to be annoyed at the delay. She could hear, now that she had been informed of it, a strange kind of chanting coming from further up the road. What is it? What is everyone waiting for? Chanting reminded her of her time in Africa, among the tribes in the wilderness, but this was not the same. This was not the comforting charm of old traditions. This was angry. This was scared. Oh, nothing much, I wouldn't have thought but whatever it is, is in the road. The man clearly wanted to say something more. His mouth was opening slightly and then clicking closed before any words that he might regret could escape. Emma chose not to watch his discomfort any longer, even though it did amuse her, and she thought she knew what he was trying to say. 
If you cannot take your animal any further, then perhaps you might escort me to the door of the club? I would appreciate it very much. The smile that broke across the scruffy man's face told Emma that yes, she had guessed correctly. She stepped from the carriage, being careful not to tread on the freshly stitched hem of her newly made dress, and took the driver's arm, linking it with hers. Shall we? she said, indicating the Victoria Club, the red brickwork and creamy cornerstones that Emma could see a little way ahead of them. She could also see a gathering of people standing outside, and was that... Could she see placards waving in the air? If you would rather, miss, I could take you home again. Emma shook her head before she had considered the driver's offer. She shook her head again more slowly when she had had time to digest it. No, no, I shan't do that. She looked at the man and smiled. I've been looking forward to this ball for some time. She winked and flustered. John MacDonald stepped forward, taking Emma with him, almost making her stumble with the sudden force of the movement. As the pair drew closer to the Victoria Club, they could make out the building bedecked with lanterns and baubles, fluttering flags and streaming ribbon decorations in various shades of gold and black. It looked as expensive as the invitation had. It looked rich. It looked, in other words, like Cedric Greet. But the crowd gathered outside was not the usual group of curious spectators wanting to see who was attending, wanting to stare in awe at the dresses, at the glamour, at those luckier than they were. Emma knew those people. She had, in her youth, been one of them, before she realised that it was better to be watched than to be watching. This crowd was loud. It was moving. It was stamping its feet and waving large wooden signs. It was not happy. Emma squeezed the driver's arm, stopping him before they were noticed. I should put my mask on, she explained. The invitation states that it must be worn upon arrival, worn until Sir Cedric makes his speech, and we are told that it can be removed. She slipped the mask over her face, instantly feeling strangely anonymous, even though half of her face was still on show, and most likely recognisable. To some, at least. To a number, she imagined. To everyone, if they could see her scar. As they approached the crowd, they could see now that it was marching, in a circle, out across the Broadway, the road in front of the Victoria Club, thus preventing traffic from passing in either direction. Impatient carriage drivers shook their heads, shouted, cursed as even more impatient horses stamped their hooves on the cobbles, snorting exhalations of furious breath. But more impatient than all of these were the men and women within the carriages. Dressed up, masked, excited, invitations clutched in expectation and hope of showing them to someone, anyone. Emma craned her neck as she passed the ones on her side of the blockade and discovered that she knew the names of some of the people within. Mrs Jones, she called out. Miss Baker, pay your drivers and follow me. Take to the streets, the walk is not far, and whatever these people are protesting against surely won't affect us. But no one exited their carriages. No one dared. And as Emma and her driver drew up to the circling protesters, she could see why she was the only one. The anti-masquerade brigade had found Sheerness preaching about the evils of a masked ball and handing out crudely printed pamphlets detailing exactly what they knew to happen at these wicked celebrations with, with illustrations to anyone who happened to pass by. Their placards raised high in the air and bobbing up and down were brief and damning. Ban this foreign influence. Masks are immoral. We are civilised in England.'